So this, the, the message this morning is just simply titled, Never Give Up. Isn't that, a simple, isn't that a simple message? Never give up. There we go. We got it. And I better get this out. Got my glasses out. Got this out. Not rubbing up against my collar anymore. And it is on. Yeah. So before we begin, let's just bow our heads and talk to the Lord. Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for your many mercies to us. Thanking you for bringing us together. And I pray that your Holy Spirit will move upon each heart here. That we won't look at others, but we'll look at you as our source of salvation and joy. Use this message today to strengthen our hearts, that we may glory in your salvation. Always we ask in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> now, anybody remember these type of bulletins? Nobody remembers these type of bulletins? Not, not, not the words on the side, but just that one picture. Oh, there, yeah, there's some truthful people here that's that are showing your age, because these would come out years ago. I don't know if they do them anymore. But this is a, a bulletin from Albert Lee, bulletin cover from Albert Lee, Minnesota. And they were ready, they that were ready went in with him, and the door was shut, Matthew 25, 10. This is the story of the ten virgins. This is the story of the ten virgins. You all remember that story. Five were sleeping and five were awake. Well, actually, they were all sleeping. Five had oil, and the other five didn't. This is what's on the inside of the bulletin. Can you read it? No. No? Good. I'll read it for you. Albert Lee, Seventh Adventist Church, Elder Wayne Gayton. <laughs> Pastor, phone number, September 12, 1981. So this is some 40 years ago. 40 years ago. Sabbath school has a Sabbath school format and so forth. And then underneath announcements, it says this. Today, announcements, today, it is with sad hearts that we bid farewell to Pastor Gayton and his family. Our love and prayers go with them as they continue their ministry in Wyndham, Minnesota. And two years later, I got the old pink slip. <laughs> but you come down here, worship service is on the other side, and it comes down, this is how we used to do it, and it comes down to the sermon, and I don't know if you can read it or not. You probably can't, because I can hardly read it here. But the sermon title is Never Give Up. Yeah, oh, you got good eyes. So not only do I have a, a bulletin here, I didn't think I'd ever use it, but I, and I don't keep bulletins often, but I usually keep sermons. And this is the sermon that I gave in Albert Lee on September 12, 1981. That's the sermon. Still there. But I think one of my kids got a hold of it and started putting circles here. <laughs> but that's okay. That's okay. Now, we look back and we remember. Anybody remember the Munich Olympics of 1972? Yes. Do you? Yes, do. Okay. What do you remember them by? Why do you remember those Olympics of 1972? The what? Black September. Black September. Yeah, I think this may have been August, but Black September. Yeah, what happened? Yeah, do you remember how many? Eleven. Eleven team members. It was the Palestinian Black September terrorist group that came into the grounds and went into the, went into the um, Israeli area, and uh, eleven Israelis were killed. It was a massacre. The head of the group, the head of the, not the Black September, but the head of the, the Israeli team, the wrestling coach, I should say, big, burly guy, he sent in his players. They were all killed. Sad. So most people remember the Munich, Germany Olympics of 1972 for that event. But there's something else that I remember from that time. This, this picture here, he's Finnish, not finished. He's from Finland. And his name is Lesse Veren. Let's say Veron. And I remember I was at AUC at the time. I was at college. Uh, let's see, 72, I would be a sophomore. And I think I watched the game some down in the student lounge. And I, um, I remember hearing about this. I didn't watch him do this. But it was, it was an inspiring story because, you know, he was in the Olympics. And what happened was, why I remember it, is that he stumbled and fell halfway through 
the 25 mile laps around for the 10,000 meter race. 25 mile, 25 laps around. He did 12, 12 and a half laps and fell. He banged into somebody, knocked him over. <coughs> and um, that's not all. When he fell, his feet were out in the running area, and some, another runner or two came by and tripped over his feet, and they fell. They were down, because this guy from Finland tripped. From time to time, we all feel down, don't we? From time to time, there are bad things that happen in our life. From time to time, we get depressed. Some, from time to time, we look at God and say, where are you? And if you haven't done that, then you need to do it. Because you need to be honest with God. Where are you when I'm hurting? Jeremiah felt that. And so we're going to look today at Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah was a young man. He wasn't very old. Not as old as me. But he was, he was younger. And you'll see that as we go through this passage. Jeremiah chapter 15. The first part of Jeremiah 15 is where God is talking to to Jeremiah and, and, and saying, you know, you're going to be beating the brass. You're going to be eating the brass, chewing on the brass. And the brass is symbolic of Babylon. This is the pre-Babylonian captivity. You got it? Pre-Babylonian captivity. But then as we come down in Jeremiah chapter 15, we see that, uh, that he's, he's saying some things there. Perpetual pain is what he's experienced. It seems never-ending. It seems overwhelming. And why don't I just give up? This is the text. Lord, you know what's happening to me. Please step in and help me. Punish my persecutors. Please give me time. Don't let me die. That's how I know he's young. Don't let me die young. It's for your sake that I'm suffering. This gives us a, a glimpse of what Jeremiah is going through. Seems horrible. But then he identifies with God, because look what he says next. When I discovered your words, I devoured them. They are my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name, O Lord God of heaven's armies. New living translation, by the way. He seems to be a little bit, uh, eh, what's, what would you say? What's he going through here? He's going through this turmoil. Why isn't God helping me? But he's also, he's also kind of blaming God a little bit. You know, where are you? But he's also saying, when I took your word, I devoured it. It really was meaningful to me. It gave me a connection to you. So what it brings on is self-pity and self-justification for his sorrow. I can feel bad because, you fill in the blank. Perpetual pain, identified with God, self-pity, justification. Look what he says here. I never join the people in their merry feasts. And you see a little bit of self-justification coming out here? I wouldn't do that. I'm a little bit better than that. I sat alone because your hand was on me. I was filled with indignation of their sin. But notice the second part, I sat alone because of your hand was upon me. What does it seem to indicate here? Who is Jeremiah blaming for his bad time? Hmm? He seems to be blaming God. I never did this. Your hand was upon me. I was filled with indignation at their sins. Doesn't that sound like self-justification? Look at this next part. Why? That's the next question that he comes up with. So he's questioning God. He gives the question. Why then does my suffering continue? Why is my wound so incurable? Your help seems as uncertain as a seasonal brook. Do we have seasonal brooks around here? Like the Animus River? <laughs> Springtime, the water just... Late summer, it's almost a trickle. That's what he means here. Like a spring that has gone dry. He's asking the age-old question that many of the prophets ask. Where are you when I hurt? 
Where are you in my pain? So God answers them. We're going to read verse 19 and then verse 21, but then we're going to go and see the middle part of it. It'll all come together here. God says this to Jeremiah. If you return to me, I will return to you. Now, is there a condition here? Yeah, where's the conditional word here? If, if you do this. And what, what he's saying here is, Jeremiah, I'm giving you a choice. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to go to Jerusalem. You don't have to go to the temple. You don't have to go to Mount Sinai. You don't have to go to these places. All you need to do is choose to return to me. So what I'm seeing here, if we go back to these texts before, what we're seeing here is that God considers, when, when, when Jeremiah is talking like this, God considers Jeremiah to be alienated. Alienated. Pushed away. He's gone aside. He took himself out of God's presence. So Jeremiah says this, or God says this, if you return to me, I will restore you so you can continue to serve me. Yes, I will certainly keep you safe from these wicked men. I will rescue you from their cruel hand. I hope you brought a Bible. You know, we should come to church with Bibles. PowerPoint takes away from that at times because there are people that don't have Bibles. But I want you to look at this passage here. I like the Bible. I like Job. Now, you know, you know Job's situation, right? He had problems like crazy. He had problems that seemed endless, seemed hopeless in his life. He sat in a, and I talked about this. Didn't I give a sermon about this a couple of weeks ago? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some people remember. I'll pay you later. They, they, he sat in a, in, a dump, in a dump where the pots were broken, and he would take those pots and he would scrape his skin. That's what it says there in Job 1 and 2. I mean, he was miserable. He asked his wife, you know, or, you know he said, or his wife came up to him and said, you know, he lost his children, he lost his fortune, and his wife came up to him and said, why don't you just curse God and die? Be done with it. Be over with it. And Job rebukes her. And he says, I like it, because he says to her, what are you, like one of those women? I like that. <laughs> Guys, need to be a little bit more affirmative. Anyway, in the middle of Job, Job starts out with Job's ailments, the bad things. Taken away. Kids, wealth, fortune, everything's taken away. Job chapter 1 and 2. Job ends with everything given back and twice as much money. Twice as much income. But between Job 1 and Job 39, I think it is, comes Job chapter 19. And in the middle is where God puts the emphasis of who he is. In the middle, Job chapter 19. We're looking down here at verse 25. For I know that my Redeemer lives. Do you get it? And he shall stand at the last, at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know. Do you, get, do you get the impact of what Job is saying here? After my skin is destroyed, after I am nothing but dust, this I know, an affirmation of faith, an affirmation of trust, an affirmation of confidence in the power, wisdom, love, and mercy of God. This I know. And what does he say? After my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my, what? Eyes shall behold, and not another. In the middle of Job, giving us the confidence that God is in charge. And that's what happens later on in Job where God comes down to him and talks to him 
forthrightly, you know, this is, this is who I am. Where were you, Job, when I did this and that and that? And Job had to humble himself and say, you're in charge. Powerful. Word of God is just powerful. Well, now look at these other passages here. This is verses uh, from 19 and 20. If you speak good words rather than worthless, worthless words. Now, what were the words that Job was talking earlier there in verses 15 up to 18? Woe is me. Which was what type of words according to this? Worthless. Because the attention then was focused on himself and not the God who would deliver him. If you speak good words rather than foolish or worthless words, you will be my spokesman. You must influence them. Do not let them influence you. How many times do we let the world influence us? How many times? Too many times, right? We let the world influence us. We let our feelings inter uh, influence us. We let what other people say influence us. And all these things that people are saying, if they're not in a solid connection, love relationship with Jesus Christ, then those words are worthless. If they're pulling down other people, those words are worthless. Because they're not from God. God wants to build up, not tear down. Notice what he says in verse 20, verse, verse 20 of chapter 15. Jeremiah, God says, they, your enemies, will fight against you like an attacking army. Oh, don't you like this next word? But I will make you as secure as a fortified wall of bronze. The next verse says, says it all. They will not conquer you, for I am with you to protect you and rescue you. I, the, which means what? Which means, what, you see it's all capital. Yahweh. Yahweh, which means? He is the covenant keeping God. He is the faithful God who will not be moved. So when we're with him, we're not going to be moved. That's where we need to be. <clears throat> now, there's a story told of a cowboy. I believe this story to be true. I believe it happened in Michigan. No, not Michigan. Montana. I knew it was an M. Uh, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, quite possibly even New Mexico. He left home for a day or two, quite a few distance away, and he realized after a few days he needed to get back home because he saw the storm clouds starting to circle around. He was about 10 miles from home when the snow started coming down. It was winter. And the wind started howling, and the temperatures were dropping. Really, really. Have you been in situations like that where it's really cold and you can't get warm? Not a lot of fun. Brutal winter storm, 10 miles from home. He finally, uh, he finally felt that it was time to take a rest. His horse would, would be slowing down, and obvious didn't want to go any further. And so he finally thought, I'm sure, we need to rest. Let's stop here. We'll rest, get our energy back, and we'll get home okay here another hour or so. Well, as it turned out, he rested, but they found him the next morning dead, only 100 yards from home. He didn't go through the end. What's the lesson for us? Never give up. You keep going. Amen. The people in our, in, our, in our church, the founders of our church, there was only maybe about 150, maybe 200, two or 300 back in 1844 on, on, on October 23 that studied the Bible more. They went over the prophecies. In fact, they were broken up into about three groups from 1844, three groups. One group, the large majority of the people just either went back to their churches or they gave up religion altogether, 1844, October 23. Another group started to continue to set times. They said, well, it must be October 22, 1854. And then they set another time, and that didn't work. And then they said, 1874. And then when that didn't work, in the 1920s, that same group said, well, he came in 1914, and only the spiritual eye of discernment can see him. And that's the group called Jehovah's Witnesses. That's right. We have roots with Jehovah's Witnesses, by the way, 1844. But then there was a third group. And they started looking deeper into the spiritual aspects of what was going on. 
And that's where our movement came from as Seventh-day Adventists. They could have gotten discouraged. They could have given the whole thing up. It would have been easy to. But they knew that God was leading them. They saw too many things happen in their time before their eyes that God was leading this movement. And that's where we sit today in the Seventh Avenue Church, which is not a church per se, but a movement of destiny to tell people Jesus is coming soon. We need to get together with Jesus. Don't give up. Don't give up. Amen. You remember this guy, Leslie Varen? What was his country of origin? <laughs> Finland. Oh, he's listening. Well, what happened to him? He fell, tripped up some other people. But he got up and he finished the race. Isn't that good news? You know what the better news is? He won. He got the gold medal, and to this day, his record has not been broken. That's what I read anyway. Record hasn't been broken because he didn't give up. See, Satan comes along to us at times and says, hey, these people aren't treating you nice. You've got to give up. Hey, it's not going the way you think it should be going. It's time to give up. Hey, we've got to wait too long to, to, to give up. Hey, you're not getting the, the acclamations. You're not getting the praise. You're not getting all the things that you're hoping for. Give up. You're too sick to be healed. Give up. Too many tragedies enter in your life. Give up. Where's God? He's with you. He hasn't deserted you. We desert God. We, don't, we, we leave on our own accord because God's love does not force us to do his will. It doesn't, it's not there. When we have a relationship with him, we want to do his will, not to please him, because we know that doing his will makes us happy. Five times in the book of Deuteronomy, between Deuteronomy chapter 4 and Deuteronomy chapter 6, I think it is, five or six times it says, God is saying, keep the law for your good. Now, you can be duteous and, and studious and say, well, I've got to keep this and keep that and keep that. No, that's not the point. Keeping the law is by love. God's love through us to the world. See Jesus come in our day. I believe it. So there's a song that I'm not going to sing, and you are welcome. Anybody remember this song? Tim, was that a hand up, or are you just stretching? Okay, you're safe. Nobody remembers this song? <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> It goes, there are days I know that you get so discouraged. It seems that all hope is gone. But there's only one who can give you courage and strength to carry on. Never give up. Jesus is coming. It's the darkest just before dawn. Never give up. Jesus is coming. Never give up. Keep holding on. Amen. Doesn't end. <clears throat> This old world, I know, can't last much longer and simply will soon pass away. But my faith in God keeps growing stronger for Jesus is coming someday. Never give up, Jesus is coming. It's the darkest just before dawn. Never give up, Jesus is coming. Never give up, keep holding on. Now, how many remember it? There are a few hands, yeah, yeah a few hands, yeah. It's a great song, great song. I even forget where I heard it, but we have it someplace, I think on one of our records. Sad things come into our lives, and sometimes they seem to be uncontrollable, insurmountable. You know, Mary here at church uh, two weeks ago told us how her grandson, 13-year-old grandson, died of disease. I don't know if it was COVID or not, but it was, it was a disease. It was COVID. This week, on Wednesday, her daughter committed suicide, the mother of that boy. How tragic. But keep hold on. We've got to keep holding on. We can't give up. Jesus is coming soon when families will be reunited. People who, who take their own lives are not necessarily lost. 
We have to understand that. Was it Samson? Took his own life. He's going to be in heaven. It's sad. But we have a tendency to judge people. Oh, you killed yourself. You can't go to. No, who are we? God? God knows the heart. He knows the circumstances. He knows the emotional trauma that's going on in an individual's life. And if one thing I know about God, something I know about God, one thing I know about God is he is ready to give excuses for the salvation of mankind. Think of that. Bending over backwards. Backwards. So we can be with him forever. So at the end of our service, at the end of the benediction, we're going to have prayer up here again. And so we'd like to invite those to come forward who have special needs, and so we can pray for Mary and her family, and we can pray for those who come forward to who have special needs. Because God knows what they are, and uh, Wes will be up with me. Maybe Ron will be up here. We need some elders up with us, and we'll be able to, to take care of this. That'd be good. So with that, may God bless us and come to know him as our loving friend because he invites us that we may allow him to fight our battles for his glory and for his kingdom. Amen.